Don't talk when I was a kid. All right. All right. So that. Okay. So for for females, females got ovaries, right? Ladies and gentlemen, females have ovaries. Yes. Yes. And those ovaries, they came from gonads. And the ovaries, well, the ovaries, they're not destined to go anywhere other than into the, so they're sitting, the gonads, so the gonads, they're sitting in the abdominal cavity. And if you're female, well, your ovaries have to migrate. Where do they migrate to, ladies? No. Fallopian tube migrates with it. The ovaries is yeah, pelvis. This is the pelvic cavity. Behind the floor of the pelvic cavity. Well, the floor of the abdomen, right? Because the floor of the abdomen is this parietal peritoneum that comes over the top of the organs. And those organs are the bladder, right? So you're going to have your bladder. So your bladder looks like this. There's your bladder. Ladies, there's your urethra. Then here's your vagina. Your vaginal tube, there's your cervix. <laughs> and there's your uterus if you're normal. But again, what female is normal? <laughs> <laughs> All right? And then behind that, so this is vagina. This is cervix. This is uterus. See that? And so what happens is when that when the, the, the ovaries come down, they migrate from midline structures, they migrate laterally. And they come into the pelvic cavity, because this is the pelvic cavity. This whole thing would be the pelvic cavity right there. And why is it the pelvic cavity? Because the 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 the, the parietal peritoneum, which is coming up the back wall of the abdomen, is gonna do like this. You know? So that's the uh, that's, there's the abdominal cavity. And and the gonads coming midline are gonna come more laterally and they're gonna really hang in the pelvis. So they're hanging on the other side because if this is mid, if these are all midline structures, right? What we're missing is the is uh, kidney, kidneys over here behind the wall, right? Kidneys over here behind the wall. Does everyone agree? Yes? Mm -hmm. Kidneys over here behind the wall. This is anterior posterior, so kidneys over here behind the wall and Rectum, right? Ascending colon and descending colon are also in the wall. Everyone agree? Everyone agree? Yes. Remember, ascending and descending colon, well, they're more lateral. Kidneys are more medial, right? But they're all behind the wall, yeah? This is why visceral organ pain, man, makes you want to throw up. Do you understand? This is why kidney stones make you want to throw up. And I can guarantee you that that's true, especially at least the first time you get a kidney stone because I've had them. The very first kidney stone, I woke up, I went to the bathroom, went to urinate, I could not urinate, but I felt like I had to urinate. And then the next thing you know, I was throwing up, uh, crawling on the floor, because the pain was so intense, okay? And I was getting diarrhea at the same time. Because the visceral organ pain, it, it, it causes, it gets reflected back into spinal cord, and then you get visceral motor response, kind of like a generic visceral motor response, which, which covers the contraction of the, of, the, of the smooth muscle in the GI wall, along with the smooth muscle that's in the ureters of the, uh, of the urinary system. You understand? Because it's, it's like this overwhelming sensory stimulus that causes an, an overall... Uh, a strong response in urination and defecation. Do you hear me? Along with vagal, some vagal input, so it's that same sacral input could go up and then come back down, be perceived by the brain, be sent through vagal nerve to then cause you to vomit at the same time. How you like that? Huh? See? Why you have to understand this stuff, guys? Because you're going to have a patient come in around 30 years of age, just like me. Mechanic working outdoors, not drinking water regularly. 
They're going to come in with flank pain. In the moment, they tell you, yeah, it hurts back here. And when I try to urinate, I can't. Or when they urinate, it's pure blood. You know it's a kidney stone. Guys, if you don't get that stone out, if they don't get that stone out, you go into acute renal failure, you go into acute renal failure, then you could die. Because your kidneys are responsible for maintaining electrolyte balance, guys. You understand? And through electrolyte balance, the blood pressure. Along with that, acid-base balance. Oh, boy. Liver's responsible for metabolism, conversion of these acids to more water-soluble forms so that the kidney can handle it. Huh? Make sense? Of course it does, because I'm not going to teach you any other way. You know, I'm pretty excited. I was telling you this morning, I came. So I got an email. So I knew I was going to get emails from a couple places, right? Because uh, I put my GRE scores out there and my name out there is just like public evidence. You know? Yeah, I took the GRE. Here's my score. Right? So I got an offer from Brandeis University up in Waltham, Waltham, Massachusetts. He said, come, come, man, come, come. We got scholarships to give you health insurance and get you to do your PhD. And, and, I, just, and I just kind of, I didn't really think about it, but yeah. Be an interesting idea if I really apply. Yeah. What you were talking about was to where exactly the kids is um the kids the um is the depression is located. I'm sorry. Where exactly the kid the kid the is depression is located. Where exactly? Because I'm not I'm not understanding that second word that you're saying. That's in which part? In the, one in, part of the kidney. In it's which part stone, of the kidney? Stones yeah. okay. the oh, stones so which so in which part of the kidney is the stone? So the storms will. So here's the problem, guys. I, so I was looking at a. Uh, if you guys know, okay, it's again back to basic chemistry. All right, in chemistry we talk about salts. Yes, and we talk about salts. We talk about salts that are what soluble or insoluble, you agree? Well, sure enough, guys, calcium phosphate, that's the main component of what? A bone. So is that a soluble or insoluble salt? Insoluble, yeah, you, guys, you, you, you see, this, this is why you pay me. This is why you pay me. This is why you pay me. You come take me because I am trying to always connect the dots. I'm sitting at my desk. I got the solubility chart sitting in front of me on my desk. It's a basic chemistry chart, a solubility chart. I got it from some website I forgot, Flint, Flint website. And sure enough on there, I see calcium phosphate. Sure enough, it's an insoluble salt. You imagine, guys, the most common form of stone is what type of stone? Calcium oxalate stones. Why? Because most calcium ions, most calcium salts are insoluble. insoluble. Thank you very much. See, guys, you see, it always goes back to basics. And now, what does insoluble mean? Ah, well, remember, if we go back to basic chemistry, and I have water, right? I have water in a container, and I put salt in there. Well, depending on the amount of salt that I put in, right? If it's a small amount of salt, then it dissolves out. Small amount dissolves. Then as I continue to add, add, and add, and then there's a concentration at which the concentration of water will, will equilibrate with that of the sodium chloride ions. And when that happens, when that equilibration occurs, then you're saturated. And anything that you would add beyond that would become a super saturated solution. So, guys, if alcohol causes your kidneys to prevent the reabsorption of water, where's the salt going? Are you at risk for kidney stones? If you lose too much water? Yeah. Ah. You see why? You stay away from alcohol? Because you dehydrate yourself and you can increase your propensity for developing calcium stones. Okay? Calcium is the most common form of kidney stone. And if it obstructs, if it begins to accumulate and precipitates out, because it's now what? A super saturated solution. You lost lots of water, but the calcium stayed behind. Then it starts to form as stones. It can form anywhere along the path. Normally it'll accumulate in the minor calyxes, include the major calyx, and then the renal pelvis, 
Those calculi are very dangerous because they'll prevent the entire amount of fluid that the kidneys nephrons are producing, the three million kidneys nephrons that are producing this filtrate, it will shut it down. Now you're only working on one kidney. Now, can you live with one kidney? Yeah, but I can tell you what, if that's happening in that kidney, you're gonna feel it. You're gonna feel it. I know I feel it every so often when I don't drink enough water. My body tells me. The problem is I lose water too quickly. This is why you never see me out in the sun. Right? And one of the reasons why I avoided the sun altogether is because I just sweat too quickly, too much. Some people dehydrate. Sure enough, the length of the nephron can adjust based on altitude and temperature. <laughs> the nephron length. And the nephron length. The length of the nephron. The, the glomerulus to the PCT to the loop to the to the the the, the, the uh, thick ascending limb, which then crosses over the glomerulus to create the JGA and becomes the DCT, and then the DCT becomes the collecting tubule, then the collecting duct. That whole thing can stretch and shrink in length, depending upon need, huh? Depending upon environment, depending upon temperature, depending upon altitude. Separately, the kidney is also responsible for the release of erythropoietin. So if the kidney feels like it's not getting its 25% of cardiac output, you better believe it's going straight to the bone marrow to tell the erythroblasts to divide to make more erythrocytes. Guys, did you hear me? So the, you see now? Hey, if I've got kidney disease, am I going to have an anemia? Yes. Everybody shake their head. Everybody shake their head. Yes. Why? Because the kidney is responsible for the release of erythropoietin. Any chronic kidney disease will affect the overall production of erythrocytes. Do you guys hear me? That is very important. Guys, this is why you pay me. I didn't know that when I took this class. I learned that much later on. I didn't learn that in medical school, for Christ's sake. I learned that after medical school. Because I'm trying to always understand clinical scenarios. It is not easy. Oh. Yeah, that's why you pay me. Right? That's why I come here with you. I come here to help you. Help you learn this stuff so you can help save lives. All right, so now, back to basics. Kidney stones are nothing more than when a salt hit reaches the supersaturation point. Either that, or you're making excess uric acid. And uric acid stones are common in people who have gout. Did everybody hear me? So sure enough, in your textbook, you talk about gout, won't it? You know, talk about the calcium oxalate stones that I mentioned, because that's the most common form of kidney stone. It talks about gout, because gout winds up being, which I think I have, I may have. You don't ask me why, but I, I got this, my, my left toe is the only thing, and I'm not sure why, it's just my left toe. But my left toe, it's my distal joint, and it just, it hurts, it just aches. It aches and it aches and it aches. I don't know why it aches, but it's just that one joint that aches. I've touched it though, it's not, it's not inflamed. But people who have gout, a, an attack of gout, it usually attacks the distal extremities, usually the toe. It's usually where it shows up first, is the big toe. And then when you touch it though, it's hot. It's warm because it's, there's an inflammatory reaction that's occurring around the joint, you guys, you understand? And anything, that will destabilize. Remember, if you guys are taking me for 2085, right? The joint is real basic, right? Joint is, uh, you got hyaline cartilage, opposing hyaline cartilage with a synovial membrane, synovial joints, you got ligaments, and then you got muscles with tendons, right? So you got your muscle, and then your muscle with your tendon, so then you have a tendon and sheath, and then you've got that bursa for the impingement, and that's the joint. Anything that would cause inflammation in that joint would disrupt the joint and destabilize the joint. Does everybody understand? And could change the protein, the structural proteins that are there for the purpose of helping to reinforce that joint. This is one of the reasons why any kind of bacterial infection in the bloodstream can actually cause arthralgias and problems with articulation because the bacteria to move out of the bloodstream, sit in the connective tissue of the joint, cause an inflammatory reaction to occur around the joint. This is what happened to my friend when he wanted to be eaten that oysters that were 
raw off the Jersey Shore that were poisoned with red tide. He almost lost his life. He spent a year and a half, and sure enough, he never walked this same. He was always walking with a cane afterwards. Good looking guy, played football for Rutgers. I think it was Rutgers. He was going from Rutgers, he was supposed to go to Princeton and, and go to graduate school, I think it was, or medical school, whatever. Rich kid. Uh, yeah. And then he, you know, he ate he ate the raw oysters. He got he got the red tide and it attacked his, his joints, his liver and his joints. And he's lucky to be alive. I don't know if he's alive still, but he was lucky to be alive then, because he, he should have been dead. Because right? bacteria in the bloodstream causes sepsis and DIC, and DIC is the one that doesn't put a smile on your face. All right? Crosses the eyes out and puts the frown on, right? That's disseminated intravascular coagulation. A lot of things can cause that. Bacteria is one of the largest ones. If the kidneys fail, you can get DIC. If you have systemic lupus, you can cause disruption in the filtration membrane and lower the glomerular filtration rate. Anything that would, that would affect the filtration membrane, guys. Remember, the, that third kidney something special. It's got that what? That glomerulus stuck in an arterial where, what the hell? You decided to put a capillary there? Seriously? And guys, it's so important. That capillary is so well designed, so important, that hey, if I have high blood pressure, if I have high blood pressure, right? running through that arterial. What do you think that arterial is going to do to prevent the, the, the glomerulus from... What would happen if I had high blood pressure? What would happen to the glomerulus? It would what? It'll blow out. It's on the high arterial side end. You got me, guys? On the other end, it's an afferent, afferent arterial. If high pressure comes from the afferent end, comes to the glomerulus, that glomerulus is going to blow up. You've lost the nephron, you see? So what do you think this afferent arterial is going to do? What do you think it's going to do? High pressure comes through, it's going to what? Smooth muscles are going to respond, it's going to be stretched more. Oh, oh, no, you don't. You're not destroying my glomerulus, man. You got me bent. This is like the third try, man. This is too important. You see? They call that glomerular feedback. It's in the book. So we have, because this glomerulus is so well, well designed, right? on the third attempt. And we have a way of protecting it in case there is high blood pressure by causing the afferent to constrict in a myo-reflex response. A myotactic reflex response. That means the smooth muscle senses it's being stretched and snaps back and protects the glomerulus. Isn't that amazing? It's freaking amazing, isn't it? It better be amazing because I said, anything that disrupts this kidney design, boy, we are shit out of luck. You can live with one kidney. Some people are born with one whole kidney. Only one kidney, functional kidney. Some are born with two kidneys that are connected as one. It's called a U-shaped kidney. It's a defect. All right? In the, connect, in the mesodermal connective tissue that creates the kidney. Creates the kidney design. It doesn't separate down the middle like it's hooked from his blood vessel. And so the kidneys wind up being lower in them. Those people who have the horse-shaped, the U-shaped or horseshoe-shaped kidney, they call it. Right? It's a U-shaped kidney, horseshoe-shaped kidney. So you can look that stuff up. There's a series of diseases. And all these diseases, all they're looking at is the differences in where the inflammation is occurring in the filtration barrier, guys. You understand? Is it on the podocyte side? Is it the basement membrane? Or is it the simple squamous epithelium? Or is it these kind of mesangeal, these extra mesangeal cells that are sitting in between? They're connective tissue cells from early in embryological development that it can be satellite cells to increase this number of smooth muscles or even develop a larger or try to repair the glomerulus, but to no avail. Once you try to repair it, it's never going to be the same. Did you hear me? Similar to lung. Once you get past a certain amount of lung damage, guys, sure enough, the lung will never be the same. Okay? But the kidney is something we can re-architecture the lung to some extent much better than we can the kidney. The liver, completely different, man. The liver's like, yo, you what? Yo, I dare you to lose half of me. Let's go. Give it up. Give half to somebody else, and your liver will regenerate in a year. 
I value this because I had two friends. I had one friend got ran over by Carlos Avistola. He survived. All right? He survived. The other friend, the one that had to go to the hospital because of the red tide, he lost half his liver, right? But because of the bacterial consumption. All right? So, um, all right. So what happens here is that in females, the uterus and the bladder, or bladder, what is that? Bladder, oh my gosh. So the bladder is sitting inferior, and this is now the pelvis. And so the ovaries are sitting, and so the, fallop the fallopian tubes are connected. They're connected here, and they'll come back like this, like this. And then they'll have their fallopian tubes. And then the ovary will be sitting right in here, and there'll be this suspensory ligament holding it in place. And, and I'll, I'll draw it, I'll draw it this way. So when you see it, you're gonna see the, the uterus, there's the top of the uterus, there's your bladder, all right? There's the urethra. And then the fallopian tubes are, are kind of, they're stretched back like this. So that you can't really see them. And the ovary's sitting right there, and it's got this ligament, it's called the suspensory ligament that's holding it. Everybody see that? And then that suspensory ligament will come off. And as it hits the body of the uterus, which is behind, it'll hit it'll hit the body of the uterus and come off. So this would be your suspensory ligament. That would be your ovary. And then this guy, right, so this whole thing here would be your fallopian tube. And this is your uterus. That's the body, this is the body of the uterus, so it's a little curtailed in. And so you imagine, because it's, it's leaning like this, okay? So as this ligament comes off, as it encase, encases the ovary and holds it, there's a new ligament that comes off, and they call that the the round ligament, I'm sorry, the, uh, they call that the uterine ligament, sorry. And when the, lig the uterine ligament hits the uterus and comes off, it now becomes the round ligament. Of the uterus. The round ligament of the uterus, sure enough, is gonna go through this canal. That canal is called the inguinal canal. And, and it'll insert onto the uh, to the CT, the connective tissue of the ABI jura. Now why is that? Oh, because you know what? This guy here, if we're male, this guy here, since you're not gonna have a uterus, because remember you don't have fallo you don't have fallopian tubes or uterus because you don't have wolfian ducts, you don't have a cervix, you don't develop vagina, then this guy here, he's gonna become the gubernaculum and pull that gonad from the abdominal cavity down through the inguinal canal into the labii major, which fused the labii minor together to create the scrotal sac. Thank you very much. Everybody see that? See? So that same ligament that goes through that it helps to attach the ovary to the uterus and then the uterus to the pelvic, to the pelvis and to connective tissue of external structures winds up being what in males they call the gubernaculum. Why? because he's going to pull and shorten and pull and shorten and pull and shorten until the gonad lands here. This is the reason why if you have a little baby boy or brother and you've ever been, you've taken them to the doctor, for the doctor to take a look at the pediatrician, the first thing they do is they grab the nutsack and squeeze it to see if the testes have descended. Because if they haven't descended, they're at cancer. They're at risk for being cancerous. Okay? They're at risk for being cancerous. So now if you go and you shadow a physician and you write to a pediatrician, you see him grabbing the nuts and the little boys, it's not because they're getting their kicks off, right? It's because they're testing to see if the testes have descended, all right? 
mothers usually have a conniption, right? And so the, what happens usually is the physician will explain to them, hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm squeezing the scrotal sac, right? The doctors will say, yeah, I'm squeezing his nuts, right? I'm squeezing to see if his nuts descended. No, he says, you say, right? Oh, no, we're, we're, we're checking to see if the gonads have descended. That's what, that's what you say. And so, you, you know, you so use the technical terms, right? But that, I mean, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Guys, if, if we've got, if everything is really default, then we have to have structures to, to, to serve both purposes. Is, does everyone agree? That's what we call homologous structures. You got me? Just like, hey, we're going to use the mon, the labii minora to fuse together to create the midline raphia of the scrotal and the, and the labii majora to make the scrotal sac. And then the gubernacum is going to pull the, pull the testicle through the inguinal canal, right? You're not going to have a uterus or fallopian tubes, you, yeah? And then not only on top of that, your wolfian duct is traveling along with the testicle through the inguinal canal to become the epididymis and the vas deferens, also called the spermatic cord when it's associated with the pampiniform plexus. This is what's serving the male testicular structure when it's sitting in the scrotum. We gotta move it. We gotta move it, guys, from up here next to the kidneys, because that's where the urogenital ridge begins. Did everybody hear me? The urogenital ridge is where we create both ural, ur urinary, and genital structures along the midlines of the vertebra on the lower side. Retroperitoneally, behind the abdomen. Makes sense? And some of those structures stay in the abdomen, and some of them move. And for females, the ovaries move from, they migrate from the abdominal cavity to the pelvic cavity. And now look what happens, guys. Now watch. This is in your textbook. If you draw the other fallopian tube with the other uterus and the suspensor ligaments and the other ovarian, you'll see the other. And then what will happen? The simple squamous epithelium of the, of the parietal peritoneum will come over it. Did everybody hear me? And when that parietal peritoneum comes over the reproductive structures, remember I told you, look what it's doing. See what it's doing? It's going over the uterus, around and under the uterus. So what it's doing is it's bathing these structures on both sides. You see that? So that also helps to reinforce the ovary in the pelvis. Ladies, you ever been kicked in the pelvis? Been kicked in the lower abdomen? All right? So that is maybe close to what you would feel if you if you hit if you hit a male in the gonads, right? So if you if you really ever got like seriously kicked in the pelvis, you'll feel like it. Like, yeah, it's very very it's extremely painful, right? And it should be, but again, that that's not even near as close as getting hit in the nads, right? <laughs> <laughs> so nad punches are not cool, right? Seeing the idiot little boys running around punching each other in the neck, just slapping them across the head, right? <laughs> Feel free to just slap them in the neck a couple times, right? Yeah. Maybe, you know, um, because yeah, it, it's just dangerous. Every time you hit, right? You get hit like that, you can cause damage to these structures, and this is permanent damage in these structures. These you, these ovaries and, and those and those testicles in males, we're making guys, we're making haploids, we're making gametes for the purpose of reproducing. Okay, that's the only purpose for gonads. You understand? That's their only purpose. So it's not about urinary, it's about, yo, let's reproduce. And we've got those structures already set up from the moment we were made. So we, we, are, all, we are all designed around our ability to reproduce. Now again, this issue between, you know, ones who choose to reproduce or, or don't choose to reproduce, those who you know, because for whatever reason, they don't see themselves as male, even though they're genetic males, they develop physically as males, they see themselves as females, or vice versa. That has to do with hormones and sensitivity to receptor. And that's nothing more than a crapshoot, man. So homosexuality is nothing more than a variation of human. And sure enough, if you look in the history books, you'll see homosexual acts having been depicted from the very beginning, from the very earliest civilizations. So this whole idea that, you know, homosexuality can be beat out of you or can be, you know, you can, it can be excised out of you, right, is bullshit, okay? It's, the, people just need to get over it, right? Hey, some guys like guys, some girls like girls, some like both, 
Whatever puts a smile on your face, I don't give a shit. Right? Just be careful that you don't get any diseases. It's all. I'm not saying not to have a smile on your face. I'm just saying, right? Keep that smile on your face. Don't turn it from an up from an right an upright smile to a down down one smile. Right? You don't want the you don't want that DIC. You want none of the other stuff, right? So that's what you got to take care of. You got to be open. You got to be open with your patients. You got to be able to talk to them about stuff like this, right? A female comes in and says, uh, man, my internal organs are so well. Talk to me. What were you doing with them? You got to ask, right? Just like the 16-year-old comes in and says, my penis hurts. He's afraid to say it in front of his mother. So I take him into the other room. His mother's insisting on being there. But guess what? In Maine, at 16, he's got the right to see a doctor without his mother. How do you handle that one, right? Yeah, yeah and then you got to go in there. You got to have this discussion with this boy, right, who, who wants to know why his penis hurts. He says, ah, oh, because you were having rough sex. But you got to ask the questions to get to the answers. You get me? Because sometimes it, people forget stuff. You get me? Yeah. So he forgot he had rough sex with his, with his girlfriend. And then, and, and then he's like, oh, I can hurt myself like that? I was like, oh, you have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> All right? But, then it's, but you see why? Like, the best healthcare workers are educators, guys. Because you have to educate your patient. At least that's in my eyes, right? I think the best doctors and best healthcare workers are those who can explain to their patients exactly what's going on at a level that they can understand. Right? And that's what I, I encourage you guys to do, um, to strive for. And so, so it's the uterine ligament, before it hits the uterus, then once it comes off the, the uterus, it becomes the round ligament of the uterus, and then it enters into the inguinal canal. It's nothing more than connective tissue, believe it or not. Sure enough, it'll aid in rooting the uterus in the pelvis to the external reproductive structures. Well, again, why is it there? It's because we needed it to pull the testic, to pull the gonad, and make it a testicle into the scrotal sac. And that's why it's still there, okay? And, and it's, it's interesting because um, these are ligaments, so when the, if the uterus rhythmically contracts, right? If you're doing your job right, fellas, right? Or ladies, I don't know, I'm not judging. Ladies, if you're doing the job right, if you're a girlfriend, right? Then the rhythmic contraction of the uterus along with the vagina, which is anchored to this tethering cord, would pull it, would rhythmically contract. Now you can see why then the labia majora would be drawn back, dilated, because there's also erectile tissue there. The idea of that is for the purpose of coitus, it's for the introduction of the of the penis in there for the purpose of reproduction. Now again, if you want to use a turkey based toy, I'm not judging you. I understand you're trying to get pregnant, I got you. No judgment, no judgment, no judgment, right? I mean, people pay top dollar to have a turkey baster inserted, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's appropriate around this time of year, right? Because I'm about to turkey, I'm about to base my own turkey, right? <laughs> so, 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 guys, when that simple squamous epi feeling with a basement membrane comes over the uterus. And it, and, it, and it goes over the suspensory ligament, and it comes over the fallopian tube, and then comes back down, it sticks to itself. Do you already hear me? And that's what they call the mesovarium, the mesalpinx, all right, and the broad ligament of the uterus, guys. So these are different structures. The whole thing is called the broad ligament of the uterus. So when this simple squamous gets slapped on the front and back, and it sticks together, you now have this broad ligament that basically anchors, ladies, your reproductive structures into the pelvic cavity. You ready, Paula? That's just the beginning. Because if we expand on this ovary now, and again, this is why you pay me. So if we go and we look now at this ovary, sure enough, that ovary starts with these little tiny cells with a couple of other cells surrounding it. And they refer to that as a primordial follicle. And under the stimulation of hormone release, 
it'll be driven from its primordial state into a primary state where the cells will begin to divide and create a layer around that cell. So now it becomes a primary follicle. Now, under more hormonal control, that layer of cells will increase in number and size. Sorry, it will become smaller in size, but increase in numbers. And what will ultimately happen is, so now we got, I'll use blue, 